Hi, I'm Ron Milner, and uh, I'm glad to see that uh, not very many of you have taken the choice back row seats. And thanks for coming. Um, I was going to talk about uh, a little bit about my career, and uh, particularly cyan engineering. Um, we were Atari's secret think tank in the mountains, and I got hired by a, by a couple guys in 1973 uh, named Steve Mayer and Larry Emmons, who had uh, gotten a lot of uh, work done with Nolan Bushnell and were doing a number of things for Atari at the time. And uh, we had a uh, lab up in the Lytton building in Grass Valley, which was, this building was practically haunted. It was built to be the area's hospital, but uh, it never was because World War II came and by the time the war was over, it, it was obsolete. So the Lytton, uh, Lytton family bought it after they sold the uh, Lytton Industries and uh, had a business that, there that's still there uh, making glass blowers lathes. Uh, we rented the part of the second floor and had a neat little lab where we uh, did video games and Steve and Larry were still trying to do video recorders with loops of tape and things like that because they came from Ampex. So we did a lot of a lot of fun things there and and a very cohesive environment. We liked being in the mountains because uh, we could keep Atari's secrets. When Atari was uh, first came out with Pong, within a couple of months there were 40 knockoffs on the on the streets. So it was it was a very competitive business. So I'm going to take you through a couple of the few of the projects I did, and hopefully we'll have time for questions at the end. Uh, one of my first things we made a we made a volleyball game, which was a variation of pong, where I could actually use my my uh, college physics to uh, uh, make the ball have have gravity. That was a that was a fun thing to do. I don't know how many they sold. <coughs> Uh, then the, uh, actually we worked on uh, Grand Track 10, but I didn't have a poster of that. Uh, this, was, this was the first um, driving game that used a, a ROM in, uh, for graphics in a, a video game, in, in our video games. I don't, I'm not quite sure what the other people were doing. And uh, uh, Steve and Larry had uh, developed this thing. I came in and helped with the sound circuits and and uh, I was an electrical engineer from uh, Berkeley and uh, I think my, most of my work on that was the sound circuits but this became a very interesting thing because it was the first uh, EEPROM and ROM uh, design where we had to had uh, ROM simulators and had to send out for the cycle of program ROMs and all the tracks and graphics were in there. And it really expanded what, what could be done over the limited capabilities of Pong and Quadrapong and that sort of thing. Uh, here was another thing we uh, uh, did that I worked on that was a uh, gravity simulation uh, with a, a different gravity, the gravity of a pinball machine. And it was a video pinball and uh, it was it was just awful. <laughs> uh, if you've ever played pinball, you, you know the, the feel and what it should do. But, and we, we could simulate the dynamics, but the, the non, uh, the non feel of a video presentation made, made it just awful. I don't know if they ever sold any. Uh, one of the things we did in uh, uh, the same year, this was like 1974, is we looked at uh, the pinball machines that we were playing with and they have, had this huge rack of 
relays and stepping relays and, and fancy stuff in the bottom that was forever breaking and, and cost hundreds of dollars to make. It was, in fact, a computer. So uh, we said, well, we can do that better because there's microprocessors now. I didn't know what a microprocessor was, but my, uh, my office mate, Steve Mayer, knew what they were, and he got the, uh, the Intel 4004 set in, and we were developing with that. It had, uh, we had a teletype machine with, with paper tape where we could load the programs on this paper tape and uh, run it in. So we took all the guts out of this uh, Bally pinball machine, Delta Queen, and we uh, hooked the Intel in and, and worked on it until it, it actually worked. And uh, we had an interesting field test uh, system at the time. We had an arrangement with Frank's Pizza down in Grass Valley where we could put our games down there and uh, uh, s split the coin box revenue with the, with the store. So we put the pinball machine down there and, and uh, it broke pretty quick. <laughs> but it was all the uh, electromechanical stuff. But the, um, the work from there, uh, um, Atari's engineering group uh, took it over and turned into a whole pinball division. Uh, maybe you've all seen the big size pinballs, Superman and whatnot that were a lot of fun. And uh, for me, the pinball was, a, was um, moving because when they finally closed the pinball division, I was able to buy a crate of the the uh, playfield glass, and uh, built a good part of my house with those those uh, tempered glass panes, so uh, you can pound on the greenhouse windows with a hammer and not break through. <laughs> so the, the the glass lasted far longer than their pinball machines. It also got Atari involved in a in a big lawsuit with Bally, but uh, that was another matter that. I didn't have much to do with. Um, 1974, we, uh, uh, my boss, Larry Emmons, was doing a game called Touch Me, uh, which maybe, maybe you saw, maybe not, but it was popularized as Simon by Milton Bradley, and I, I really think it was an original gameplay to memorize a sequence and associated tones. Uh, and it was done as a coin-op game, sold a few of them, and then got hopelessly knocked off. <laughs> uh, in 1975, uh, I personally did a game called Quack, and I can't remember if it had, I don't think it had any microprocessors in it, uh, but it was a, a shooting game with a, a gun, and I figured out how to... Uh, uh, figure out where the uh, a gun that wasn't in a socket or anything, a handheld uh, rifle, was aimed at the screen and, and I did it the easy way. What I did is I made the screen completely white for a frame so it would be uniform and I could you know, look at the timing of when the received blip in the gun was that um, said where it was and then go back to the video of the duck so the blast coincided with the sound, and that was the shotgun blast, and it was a, it was a good effect. <laughs> so it was very serendipitous to uh, uh, making that work. Uh, Outlaw was a, uh, uh, used the same gun in a handheld version. The, that same year in 1976, uh, my boss, Larry, was involved in a, an arcade device to uh, take pictures and print them out like the old photograph machine, but this was with a, with a huge line printer and a, a computer-generated uh, uh, screen. So it was, uh, it was 950 pounds, it was huge, and I don't know if they ever sold any of those things, but it was it was an epic project for Larry. Uh, Steve and I worked on Tank 8 that year, which was an eight-player 
game that had a microprocessor. I think it, I think it was a 6500, but I'm not sure, or a 6800. Yeah. <coughs> Um, that was a that was a a big project just because of the size and the number of stations they had to do, and we only had a couple technicians, so there was a there was a lot of hands-on work. Um, it was interesting that that kind of in this time frame, our our group up there became really cohesive, and and we were all all friends and. Later on, everybody helped each other building their houses. Uh, uh, everybody was building a house, and the work party showed up from from uh, work. And we also had a lot of really good company parties because we had a party fund from the uh, machines working down at Frank's Pizza. <laughs> that, that helps a lot for the entertainment. And we continued those we continued those parties. Uh, uh, for quite a while after uh, after Atari folded, because uh, we I think we still had a machine or two down there. Well, then there was then there was the big one, the 2600. Um, Steve Mayer, uh, my my office mate, we shared a we shared an office about the size of these two tables, so uh, we we were pretty close. It's a good thing we got along. Uh, he he was a kind of a computer whiz, and um, we went down to uh, the Westcon show, and you've all probably heard that story where we met uh, Chuck Peebles of uh, of uh, with his 6502s in a in a jar that he was he was selling for twenty five dollars, and and we bought a couple. Uh, I don't think we knew that they were duds at the time, but. Uh, they were very impressive to get started thinking about and designing uh, a computer. And the Atari at this time uh, had a, a chip designer named Howard Lee who had done a, the home pong and was, was looking at uh, successors to make home video games, which looked lucrative at the time. They sold quite a few of the, of the home pong games. And the next step in the evolution was going to be a, a tank game, and he started designing chips for that, and it was it was getting huge. And there was a, there were only so many uh, transistors you could fit on a chip at a time. It was really small, and we we said, well, let's look at doing it with a uh, with a microprocessor to help. So we started working, and we looked at what what we could uh, do with hardware and the coin-op video game boards, you've probably seen them, they're like 100, 120 chips of uh, uh, MSI scale chips. There, there's no way you could get that kind of complexity shrunk onto one LSI chip at the time. So I said, well, what if we just, what if we just did the horizontal part of it and let the computer do the vertical part. It seemed really sketchy, but the 6502 was, was pretty fast compared with the, uh, with the Intel chips at the time, and, and we, we thought we could do it, and we started prototyping it. And I'm not sure which of the, which of the prototypes this was, but uh, we prototyped the, uh, the tank game and, and uh, it was looking more and more promising. We brought in, uh, uh, Steve and I brought in Joe DeCure as a, a fellow who would be the engineer programming the first games and taking it down to uh, Atari and Sunnyvale, sort of personally shepherding it into uh, becoming a product. Uh, so he was in Grass Valley and did a, uh, a combat, cart what became the combat cartridge as a, demonstration of what could go into a home game and go into an LSI chip. Uh, we worked on this project for a long time by, uh, by our standards. We probably worked on it for two months. <laughs> uh, and uh, 
had some some good demonstrations of it and and uh, Joe took it down there and uh, got Jay Miner who was a, a chip designer and they worked on it and became a became the video game uh, I'd like to tell people that the 2600 was the uh, last project I want to work on that starts a billion dollar industry without me getting a piece of the action. <laughs> <laughs> Nolan did offer me a, uh, uh, Steve and me a, a piece of the action as it were. He said we could get a, uh, a piece of the profits from the 2600, but we'd have to give up our salaries. Now we'll take the salaries. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> Who knows? So, you guys have been inundated by uh, um, 2,600 sessions, and uh, uh, that's become a, really a, a cornerstone of this industry. It was um, it was significant, really, that uh, that we could turn it out and, and get it running with our little our, our Kim board and our uh, our RAM simulators and stuff in in such a short time and uh, everything was a was a compromise to to try to save a few transistors the, the sound circuit is mediocre because you know there was room for like a couple of polynomial counters and and that's it for the sound circuit uh, the horizontal counters were were some of those I think were polynomial counters it was a, it was a, a huge save on hardware. The way the, the programmers were later forced to uh, scrimp every bit of code to fit them in the 4K cartridges. Uh, the whole thing was a, was a matter of cramming, and that was actually a good discipline for engineers compared with, with <coughs> now, where oh, it's going to be three megs or four megs. I don't worry about it. Uh, you know, it was couple extra bytes to make the difference of whether it fit or not and a few extra transistors whether it was going to be a chip that they could make and get decent yields on so pretty inter pretty interesting puzzles from an engineering standpoint uh, then I worked on a worked on a coin coin op game called starship and uh, later this afternoon at uh, 4.30, Ed Fries and I have a, a session in, in uh, Auditorium B about uh, a little surprise that I put in the code. Uh, this was my first programming exercise uh, where, where I did the whole thing. And a uh, couple interesting things about the, the Starship game, it was a... Uh, the first time that we had done a, uh, a first-person game where you were, were looking out the front and, and things zoomed past, and gave a presentation like, like you were really looking out. Uh, I'm not sure whether it was the first in the industry, probably had been done many times at uh, MIT-owned computers, but it was, a, it was a lot of fun getting that feeling. And to add to that feeling in the prototype of, uh, of Starship, uh, I made a, a, a coil around the yoke of the monitor. Uh, this didn't make it to production. You know, if you have an axial magnetic field and an electron beam going, it makes it spiral. So the effect of a DC field around the yoke is that the whole display rotated. So I had it set up so that when you turned your turned your yoke, the whole picture in the display was rotating to give you a feeling that you were you were really driving the starship. And I think this got used in a, a later game, but not in Starship. So that was a that was a fun game. Come later to uh, our session we'll tell you about the secret code I put in there. Up in, uh, up in Grass Valley, we did work on a number of uh, coin-op games for, for several, several years. 
uh, we made us uh, as I think we made a submarine game. Uh, I know Dennis Koble worked on it down in uh, uh, down in uh, Sunnyvale. Uh, we also played a lot with uh, 3D. Uh, one of the uh, one of the ways of generating a, a 3D visual at that time was to take a big loudspeaker and put a piece of mylar over it and use the sound from the loudspeaker to reflect, to deflect the mylar, which made a mirror. And by, if you reflected it off of the CRT, you could modulate it and you could actually generate kind of a, kind of a, whoa, 3D effect. It was a, just a complete dud. It really didn't. <laughs> it, it was it was expensive, and it turned out with all the 3D experiments we did, and and following the color separation and all the stuff over the years that that 3D really you know it was a little whiz bang, but it it really didn't do anything for the for the gameplay of things. It was a it was like it was a just a side trip. Uh, the better graphics that have come over the years have made things, you know, way whippier, but basic gameplay is still what's fun. I mean, people still have fun with things like Breakout. Uh, we did, uh, in the graphics field, one of our ways of getting graphics was to uh, use a laser disc player, because we figured we could put one of these big Panasonic laser disc players in a uh, in a coin-op game and and have video that uh, video clips and things that we're doing and we had a bunch of these big laser disc players and generated our our games and does anybody know did those ever come out <laughs> I assume I assume they didn't uh, we, we had a vision for uh, uh, cooperative games and game strategies. We, uh, uh, we wanted to do a, f a fire truck game where, where one player is the, uh, drives the front and one drives the back, and, and the two of you have to cooperate to uh, achieve a goal rather than, than uh, conflict and, and have a winner. <clears throat> Later on, uh, the, um, the group up in Grass Valley worked on a number of the home computer projects. We did, uh, I personally worked on a lot of pointing devices for Alan Kay, uh, who Atari had brought in from Apple. And he, he was a really neat guy to uh, work with because it was like, like, you know, everything he said Oh, this is a genius. Well, <laughs> let's let's help him. He was um, he was just just incredible. We went to uh, uh, spent hours talking with him about uh, all the concepts, and he really he had a vision of the future of of computing that's shaped a lot of where uh, of where computing is now. So these pointing devices that. Uh, uh, I, I got to work on that project for ooh, a long time. I probably worked on it for six months doing various versions. I had an, an Etch-a-Sketch version where, where you moved a, moved a little pointer and it did the encoding wheels like an Etch-a-Sketch, uh, or ones with arms moved. I did optical mice with a moiré pattern interference to, to uh, generate uh, left and right pulses. We did, a, we did some, the, the main vision that came out of it was to have something that looked like an IBM keyboard and where the numeric keypad was to have a little, a very small, we called it a tab mouse, just a little tab that stuck up because with fine, the fine motion control you have like writing, uh, you can you can do everything. I mean, you can work your phones now, but but at that time to 
use a, a mouse that was built into the keyboard was, was pretty cool. That was a fun thing. Um, we did a project to use optical memory for, for game storage because even a photographic image of, of what was achievable could get really high densities compared with, with uh, buying ROMs and, and bit, uh, bit storage that way. And this was really just, this CD ROMs were just barely coming out at that time and, and uh, the video discs were, were that big. So uh, being able to imagine uh, something like a photographic slide that you shoved into a game and had your game software on it, that, that was a reasonable thing to investigate. Uh, probably my favorite project that I worked on at Cyan Engineering, I called the skiometer. Uh, we were, by that time, we had some latitude in what we could play with, and Atari wasn't interested in listening to us about what they should do in video games to be around in 1985. Uh, so we did some other fun things. Uh, the skiometer was, was my answer to the question of how to go skiing on company time and have it be legitimate. <laughs> it was a, an ultrasonic device that you would wear around your waist that would bounce uh, ultrasonics off the ground in front of you and uh, measure the Doppler shift of the received signal to know how fast you were going. Uh, it turned out that uh, after several tests at uh, at uh, Squaw Valley in the summertime that uh, this wouldn't work because when you when you turn your skis it, and the snow is at all icy it makes ultrasonic noise that wiped out the signal completely but it turned out it worked on the uh, worked on pavement and uh, uh, after Atari dumped us I was able to license that back from the Tremils and uh, uh, sold the concept to Nike uh, as a runner's meter. It used a ultrasonic off the ground in front of you, a speech synthesizer into into headphones, had a heart rate monitor. <clears throat> in it. And uh, that was really a fun project. We we did a we did a analog LSI chip for it. And uh, Nike actually sold the product for a while. <clears throat> Unfortunately, they uh, they assigned one of their marketing uh, castoffs to that division, and uh, I think the only paid advertisement for the Nike monitor, uh, the runner's meter, um, he placed in Home Furnishings Digest. <laughs> Go figure. Well, that, that, uh, that's a, a quick overview of my Cyan engineering days. Uh, the, the very end is interesting when in 1985, after things were busting and they kept bringing in new managers at, at Warner for Atari, uh, uh, I think the last one was a guy from the cigarette company, and uh, he knew how to sell cigarettes. It, it, was, it was a little bleak, and finally uh, we got the call one day that uh, they were pulling the plug. And, uh, boy, a lot of, lot of, lot of TVs and uh, suitcases hit the door that day. <laughs> I still have the tin suitcase. It, uh, I, had the, I had the wisdom to uh, uh, not really move out, so... <laughs> I kind of hunkered in, in my office uh, across the hall from the main place and waited for someone to come get all their stuff and, and collect, but it never happened. So I somehow gave the landlord of the building, which was not Atari, uh, uh, some money for the stuff and established my company there in the same, same place. I, I still have the uh, 
the old Atari parts cabinet. <laughs> it was a, a really good way to start a business. I was going to quickly run through some of, oh no, no, wait a second, I've, I've got another Atari project here. Uh, Pizza Time Theater, my goodness. That was, we did the prototype of the animation for Nolan Bushnell. Um, we didn't help him with the pizza. It was re really bad pizza. He wanted to show that uh, uh, that the fun and the games were, were more important than having good food. So uh, we, we uh, prototyped the uh, entire setup in uh, Grass Valley and had it set up in our room and developed an animation system with a uh, information on big TAC tape recorders that would uh, that would play in the back room. Mm -hmm. all, all the characters were uh, operated by air cylinders because they were they're really reliable and and uh, were easy to control and so I learned a lot about air control. There's a picture there's a picture of the TAC uh, down in the system and uh, I, I personally worked on the worked on the talking rat. I I thought of looking for another job at that time, and I said, "What could I, what could I tell people I, I did? Built talking rat? I don't think so." <laughs> so that was a fun episode. We uh, we built the prototype and we we moved it down and installed it in the first theater on uh, uh, Winchester Boulevard in San in San Jose, and. Uh, were there for the openings and stole a lot of t-shirts. Had a good time with that. Do you have a talking rat? Uh, I don't have a talking rat, no. <laughs> uh, since then, I did, I, I did some interesting stuff as Applied Design Labs, which was my company. Uh, I don't know how to away. There it goes. Um, I did a, a 3D pointing <coughs> device that used a L-shaped frame over your TV uh, that I got together with Paul Terrell who had started the bite shops and uh, manufactured and sold as the Sonicher Space Pen. Um, my prototypes also went to Jaron Lanier for his first, his first uh, virtual reality uh, data glove projects. Uh, and as it turned out, somebody stole it along the way and sold it to Mattel for the the, the power glove, but the, I didn't have anything to do with that. That was that was way ahead of its time. Yeah, we had a, some demos where you could sculpt in in 3D, but it was it was years too soon. Uh, there's a picture of the Nike monitor, which I told you about. Uh, you strapped it on your waist. The, the interesting thing about this is is. Uh, I really worked on the technology, and this thing could be accurate in measuring distance to within 10 feet in a mile. It was, it was amazing. Compared with a pedometer, which is like, you know, a quarter mile in a mile, uh, this was right on. People would could use it to lay out, uh, lay out running courses with some confidence that it was accurate. Uh, then Applied Design Labs did some other really interesting projects. Uh, we did musical toys for Tyco Toys, hot licks and hot keys. Maybe some of you had them when you were kids. Uh, that made some really cool sounding music when, uh, without really having to know what you were doing. It put together basically uh, contiguous tracks and let you jump between them to, to get all the variations. I think my highlight was with a, with a hot keys uh, when uh, uh, someone was having a, uh, a concert in San Francisco and they invited me up to uh, on this big stage with big amps to play my electric plastic guitar. Uh, it was Todd Rundgren. <laughs> and uh, that was fun. Then uh, spent a number of number of years actually working out the command control system for uh, Lionel Trains. Uh, Neil Young was was our client, and it was it was really fun working with him over the years, and, and uh, 
figuring out how to control electric trains. <coughs> Recently, we did a remote control system for broken box toys, uh, which are little construction things. We wanted to make it look like a video game controller, but it was actually driving construction vehicles. This is my son Ben's industrial design. That was a good project. And then to show complete audacity as an inventor. Uh, hey, where's the play button? I'm clicking. Help! <laughs> this is a picture of reinventing the wheel. Now it's not working. <laughs> it worked it worked in practice it did anyhow my idea was that a, a wheel is inefficient because it, it like you have to have a tire that goes all the way around when really there's just a tiny bit in contact with the ground at a time so I invented a wheel that would roll along on feet without any without the lumpiness of fixed wheels it has a cam inside and we modeled it uh, on one of these broken box vehicles, but unfortunately the video of it is on an obsolete computer that doesn't work anymore. <laughs> it says it's playing, but it's not playing. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> That's good. Cool. So I wanted to, I wanted to open things up for some, uh, open things up for some questions if you have any. And we're questionless. Was it that out, that astounding? <laughs> Yeah? The video games have changed so much since you were working on them. Back then, what was like the most advanced you could imagine a video game to be? Well, actually, every game we were working on at the time seemed, seemed to be really pushing it. Uh, uh, the, the, grand, the grand track where, where there were, you know, there was a, a, a race course compared with a couple of blocks generated by hardware was, was, was amazing. And, and, and something moving around, whoa. <laughs> so, yeah, um, the capabilities have, have <coughs> grown and the imagination has expanded over the years to, to, uh, to match. Yeah, it's amazing what the, what the games do now. But there's still a lot of a lot of gameplay in in as we've seen in in the the old games where you know it engages either action or uh, you know I still play the old uh, computer adventure game where where you X Y Z Z Y was important to know. <laughs> Anybody else? <coughs> yeah. Uh, on your work on the Atari Twenty Six Hundred, what do you feel is your biggest contribution there? that you were, I know it was a team effort, not just you, but what do you feel is your personal input into that design? Well, I, I, I essentially did the, did the hardware and Steve did the software of the original, original concept. And, um, I personally created all the, uh, created the sound circuits that, um, I think there's some patents on, there's a patent on that and the, uh, the, the motion stuff for that, which was really just the horizontal part of the, of the uh, action. The, the, um, the 2600 was, was meant to play, you know, pretty limited set of, of games like the, like the combat games. It wasn't supposed to do the stuff that, that the programmers later did with it. That's, that's a, that was a complete fluke. <laughs> according to our intentions <laughs> and uh, they were great and uh, the ability to to uh, change an object on the fly uh, with only the 6502 is, is, was just astounding to us <laughs> so it was it was an ev it was an evolution 
from you know some pretty simple simple hardware to uh, you know, programmers learning to do amazing things because they had a little control of it. You know, looking back on it, you know there were some there were some trade offs that uh, that uh, shouldn't have been made. We we shouldn't have saved the uh, the 20 cents on the package and used the big, we should have used the bigger computer package so we could have had a bigger address space. Uh, I'm sure a lot of you beat your head against that. Uh, but absolute minimum cost was, was the trade-off, as it has been for, you know, most of the, the toy products that I've worked on since. You kind of, you know, take a shot of, of what will work and how you can keep it absolutely as cheap as possible. Do you uh, play or examine any of the current video games today? No, I play pinball. <laughs> I, 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 got, I got burned out on the video games early on. Because <laughs> okay. I started out with 2600 and I'm into massively multiplayer role playing games and such. The evolution of the technology has, has changed so much in just my life. Yeah, yeah. You, you kept up. You kept up on it. I, uh, as I said, I, I love a good pinball game, but I, uh, I don't, I don't play the video games. I leave, I leave them to, leave them to the rest of you. <laughs> Any other questions? Back there. Um, came a little bit late, but I'm just wondering if you had any involvement in the um, Atari A10 disk drive when it first came out. Had a lot of reliability problems in there. So there was an upgrade that was done later on to improve its reliability that is often referred to as the Grass Valley board. So I'm wondering if you were involved in that. Uh, I, recall, I recall that project, and uh, I wasn't personally, personally on it. Uh, we were doing several things for the home computer. I think that when I was working on it at the time was to try to make a, try to make a low-cost printer and uh, at that time, uh, Daisy Wheel technology was 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 the hot item compared with with the, the hammers and and uh, so we 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 were working on a Daisy Wheel printer that hopefully could be made for uh, uh, a consumer price, and uh, somehow that never happened. <laughs> Over here? Do you think you guys were the first ones to invent blowing on the cartridge? To invent what? Blowing on the cartridge. Did you guys have <laughs> Were you the first one behind that? Uh, it was either blowing or pounding. I can't remember. <laughs> yeah. Uh, were you guys involved at all in the graduate, the computer add on for the 2600? It's designed, it never came out, but I was just wondering if you had any part or were. Well, after, yeah, the uh, we we kept proposing proposing new systems and and block diagram form and arguing and begging the uh, management to let us do the projects, and uh, uh, the argument was that hey, we're making we're making a billion dollars a year off of this. Why should we do it? Do something else that's going to kill this? Um, you know, it was just exactly the short-sighted management that, uh, that ended Atari. Uh, the uh, the uh, 5200 we were, we were involved with, but uh, you know, we, we, were, we were way into proposing next generations of hardware as we saw you know, Moore's Law happening and, and, and the amount of stuff we could put on chips becoming significantly greater and, and uh, uh, disk drives uh, becoming higher. And, I mean, we, we were doing work when a 10 meg drive for the Vax was this big round thing that weighed 20 pounds. And that was 10 megs and that was a lot. <laughs> but then, you know, when the little floppies happened and, and uh, uh, everything was, was getting smaller, I mean, it, it was in that period, and, and we told the management, "Hey, the, the graphics have to get better. The action has to get better. Um, you've got to have, you know, more art, more teams." And it didn't happen, so it went away, and uh, Nintendo started it up. <laughs>
Anybody else? Back there? Uh, did, could you tell me about how you participate uh, in the creation of the antique chip? Uh, the the uh, the antic chip was was mostly my uh, office mate Steve Mayer's uh, work. I, I helped a little bit, uh, you know, in the the hardware design and uh, uh, debugging the wire wraps and stuff. But uh, uh, the architecture was 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 mostly Steve Mayer's. Okay. They say they say I'm about done. Thank you. Thank you very much for coming. <laughs>